So this is our fifth in the series that we're going through on the, uh, on the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. And we're looking at, at a truth that is um, it's so important for us to understand. And hopefully I'm going to be able to impress upon you just how significant the, the, this passage is in our understanding of how and why we worship God the way we do today. So imagine a Black Friday sale that starts at 3 a.m. And the people are lined up outside of the store trying to, to get inside. They're looking at it from the outside. They, the, the doors are still locked and they see all the great items in the window. Or maybe they saw some things in the store flyers and they're, they, they want to get a hold of those things. They want to have them and so they're pressing against the doors. But as long as the doors are locked, there's no way for those potential customers to have access to all those great and wonderful items that are inside. The walls and the doors keep the employees inside and everyone else outside. However, when the manager opens the doors at just the right time, at the appointed time, suddenly there's this rush of people running in to try to take advantage of all these great sales, and now everyone has access to all those wonderful things that are inside. Now, perhaps uh, if you paid attention to the scripture passage that I read earlier, you can see where this illustration is going, and you, you maybe understand what I'm trying to say here. Those on the outside were the Gentiles. Those on the inside were the Jews. And the doors separating the two were keeping them apart. Now, any illustration, uh, you don't want to think it too hard. Think about it too hard because you're going to find plenty of ways in which the analogy doesn't fit the point that I'm trying to make. On the other hand, there are always those that, that like to take the challenge, and I would say, okay, well, take this analogy and think about it and find all the ways that it doesn't fit. And so that way it kind of challenges your mind about these truths. Whichever way you want to go, uh, I, I would uh, encourage you to do that. So you can talk to me after the service and say, no, that analogy about the store doesn't really fit exactly this way. But the main idea, I think, hopefully you can you can understand. What is described in the passage which we read in verses 11, 22, and then again into chapter 3, and we'll be looking at this in more detail next week as well, it's talking about the most dramatic shift in God's relationship with mankind since the 1800 years of human history prior to the time in which it was written. In other words, for 1800 years before these words were written, that the, the relationship between God and man was completely different. And this represents a monumental shift in how God now was dealing with mankind. There's no way that we today can fully understand and appreciate the magnitude of what the Apostle Paul is saying in these verses. We were born into a time which for the past 2,000 years has taken for granted the fact that all people of every race, language, tribe, and nationality or ethnicity has equal access and standing before God. We truly cannot fathom what it would mean to be separated from God, not because of unbelief, but because we were not a part of God's chosen covenant people. Paul is relating a truly earth-shaking concept for those who were living in the first century, those that were alive at that time. Verse 11 begins with the words, Therefore, remember, which reminds us that he is writing to a contemporary audience. He is telling them to call to mind something of which they have, of which they have living memory. The readers of that letter have a personal recollection of a time in which they were on the outside looking in. Now, history can be related in two ways. There are those who recall events because they went through them. And then there are those who, through secondhand sources, ha are able to relate the experience. Now, uh, do we have anybody here? Is there anybody here that remembers, has living memory of World War II? We have a few there. Okay, yeah. Somewhat, yeah, a little bit. Okay, a few of you still can remember World War II. How many of you have, uh, have a living memory of the Korean War? Okay, a few more. How many of you have a living memory of the Vietnam War? 
Okay, we're seeing a few more hands there. Okay, how many of you have a, a living memory of the first Iraq war? Okay, okay. I'm looking at the kids over there, and they're saying, what, what, what were all those things? How many of you have a living memory of the second Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan? Hopefully everybody in this room should, because the others, if you don't, you should be over in the children's church, I'll tell you that. Okay, and so we, we know about World War II. Most of us here, all of us know about World War II, but we have it through secondhand sources. We don't, for most of us. There are a few that lived through it, and then as we progress through the timeline, all of these things, some of us then can remember specifically what it was like during those days uh, what, the, what we were experienced, or what were the emotions, what were the things that were talked about on, on, on television, on the radio, and, and uh, all of these ways. Well, that was having a living history. And when Paul wrote these things, when he tells them, remember when you were um, Gentiles, according to the flesh, and alienated from God, he's, saying to, he's talking to people that would actually have remembered what that condition was like. If you've ever been to the Indiana History Center, they have exhibits in which uh, they project, you can go inside and they, they, they project an old photograph on a steam screen before you walk into the room. You, they, they have uh, the door is darkened but th with a curtain behind it and then they have a, a screen there of, of steam and then they project a, an old picture on that, on that steam so that you get the feeling of actually walking into the picture. And then you walk into the room, and then they have actors who have studied the events surrounding that historical picture, and they have looked at the primary sources that are there, and they stay in character the whole time, and you're able to interact with them and ask questions about what it was like to have gone through those events, uh, trying to give as much as possible a, a sense of that firsthand experience of history. But even that, however, however well they study those things, they still are not able to really appreciate what someone who has actually lived through such an experience would have, would have felt like. And we once, uh, once we had an event here at the church, now well, it was before we moved here, we, we actually held it over when we were back in English Avenue and we held it at the, uh, at the library, which we had a, a, a counselor come to share about marriage and family enrichment. And she introduced herself and told us that she had been abandoned by her husband and had gone through a divorce. And she related how she never wanted to forget how it felt at that moment, that, that sense of abandonment that she had, so that she could empathize with those with whom that she was counseling and dealing with in, in similar situations. And similar, similarly, as I've worked in social work, uh, I've had uh, social workers that have said that they, who they themselves had been through the foster care system, telling me that they try to emphasize with the ch empathize with the children with whom they work by remembering the loneliness and the isolation they felt when they were separated from their birth families and placed with strangers. This idea of trying to be able to empathize with the situation that people were actually feeling. This is what Paul is saying to the readers of the Ephesian letter. He tells them to try to remember when they were isolated from God and there was a clear barrier between the Jews who were able to draw near to God by virtue of the covenant that God had made, made with Israel and the Gentiles who were isolated from God who were on the outside. Paul uses very frank language to explain the condition that the Gentiles were in prior to God breaking down that wall which separated them from the Jews and the Jews with their direct access to God. As most of us aware, are aware, in Genesis 12, we read of when God called one individual. Back in the, in the book of Genesis, you have the story of God calling Abraham, one individual whose name was later changed to Abraham, and to whom was given promises that through his offspring all the world would be blessed. This, of course, was after mankind in general had failed to be obedient to God's expectations and his requirements. We read in Romans chapter 1 how mankind at one time knew God, but it says they did not glorify him as God. Their foolish hearts were darkened, and human beings began to, create, to, to worship the created things rather than the creator. They started to go into idolatry. So it says mankind one time knew God, 
but did not glorify God and then became separated from him even farther. Of course, man was separated because of sin, but that separation, that gap even increased because their knowledge of him was lost. They did not give glory to God, and then they became even more isolated from him. In order to fulfill his promise of redemption that he gave to Adam, God called out the descendant, the descendants of one individual. So the separation between God and man was something that existed before the calling of Abraham and before the nation of Israel was established. Now, there are critics of the Bible who will try to argue, well, God was a racist and he was ethnocentric because he just chose one people through whom to channel his blessings and to reveal himself, the, the descendants of Abraham. But the fact of the matter is that the gap between God and man already existed before the calling of Abraham. The calling of Abraham was actually an act of God's mercy. When mankind in general had isolated himself and, and, and alienated himself as far as he could from God and was now worshiping the, the things that were created, worshiping idols and worshiping the rocks and the stars and all of these other things, God chose one, one particular individual, gave him these blessings as an act of mercy to give mankind yet another opportunity so that God could fulfill his promise of a redeemer. And so by God choosing Abraham and, and channeling his blessing through these people, it wasn't that God is ethnocentric or God was racist or God was, was just you know favoring them. It was because this was how now he could reach the rest of the world. It was actually an act of mercy. The calling of Abraham was another opportunity for mankind to have hope and for God to fulfill his promise of a redeemer. God gave the promises of a nation, a land, and universal blessings to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then he doubled down on that relationship at Mount Sinai, where he gave the law to Moses. And so now Israel, the nation of Israel, had this special position and responsibility to receive God's revelation and to preserve it and to share it with the rest of the world. Now, in this passage that we just read, Paul describes five ways in which the Gentiles, those that were outside of the nation of Israel, the non-Jews, were alienated from the blessings of God. Oh, by the way, I just I threw this one in at the last minute. It's, this is a, um, a, an artifact that's in a museum in Israel, and it was taken from the site of the, of the temple uh, at the, about the first century, or just the, the first century before Christ. And what it says is basically that foreigners are not allowed on this premises. So it was just a way of, of emphasizing the idea that the Gentiles were separated from God. They could not enter the, 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 the grounds of the temple because they were on the outside. So as it says in Genesis chapter 2, 11 through 12, that the Gentiles were separated, and there are five ways in which they were separated. First, they were separated ceremonially and symbolically because they were uncircumcised. After God called Abraham and gave him the promises of descendants, a nation, a land, and a blessing, he confirmed that promise with a symbolic act, that being circumcision. It was a ceremonial and symbolic way of identifying the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as part of the chosen race and incorporating them into the nation. Those who had not gone through this ceremony were then considered outsiders, separated from the promises given to the chosen people. If someone wished to be part of that select group, they could, they could join, but all the males needed to be willing to submit to this ceremony of circumcision. So the Gentiles, being on the outside, looking in by virtue, they were on the outside looking in by virtue of the fact that they had not been circumcised, something which was extremely important to the Jews. This was an identifying characteristic of being on the inside. This is how people knew who you were. Now, notice in the text that Paul emphasized that this was something done physically, that they were circumcised in the flesh. Circumcision in and of itself was not enough to make a person right with God. And we read throughout the Old Testament of how there needed to be a circumcision of the heart, that just going through the ceremony while it was required, while it was necessary, was not in and of itself enough in order to bring a person right with God. They had to have a true heart conversion as well. 
needed to be sincere in their hearts, but nonetheless, it was a requirement to be part of the chosen people. One could not be a Jew and still refuse to be circumcised. So first of all, they were separated symbolically. Secondly, they were separated without a deliverer. They were without the Messiah. Note that Paul describes the Gentiles as being without Christ. He is using this word in the strictly Jewish sense here. Christ is the English transliteration of the Greek word Christos, which is the translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. In this context, it is best to read this passage as being without Messiah, because when we read Christ, uh, it has a lot of, of um, actually uh, Christ Christianized overtones to it. So I think it would be better to read that passage, they, the Gentiles were without Messiah, without the anointed one. For the Jews, the Messiah was the one who was going to save the nation from its enemies. He was, yes, also the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of, of the nation. But in the Old Testament, the Messiah is also the one who would come and bring judgment on the enemies of Israel. He is also the one who would establish a kingdom of righteousness and holiness and rule the world from Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, Messiah was the savior of Israel. And once again, if anyone wanted to be part of what Messiah was to do, they had to convert to Judaism. This was the, the picture that, that is given there. They had to be circumcised and they had to follow the law of Moses. And so the Gentiles were without Messiah uh, prior to God opening this door. Third, the Gentiles were separated politically. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The Greek word that's translated as commonwealth is politias, from which we get our word politics or political. Israel was not only a religious community, but they were a political community. They were a nation state. It had political leadership that governed its citizens. And the Gentiles were not part of that. They were outsiders and they were aliens. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news this last week about aliens and strangers and foreigners and immigration and whether or not we should allow them into our country. That is, of course, a debate that I'm not going to get into at this time. But one thing that is clear is that when the situation such as that arises, it clearly reminds those who are aliens in a foreign land that they are without rights and privileges of that, of the, that nation's citizenry. Anyone who has been in the situation that where you are trying to enter into another country, when we were missionaries, of course, we did that. If you were in the Sunday school class, Gomer was sharing about what they had to go through, the interrogation they went through just earlier this week in order to be able to enter into this country. And you understand that, that, that sense of helplessness, of powerlessness, of vulnerability, that you have this individual who bureaucrat sitting at the other side of a table who has your fate in his hands. And there's really nothing you can do. He's going to make that decision as to whether you stay or go. It's, it's just, it, it's a terrible feeling of being completely powerless, completely vulnerable. And it should remind us likewise as Christians that in the Old Testament the Israelites were repeatedly told to be kind and generous to the foreigners in their midst. They were not to take advantage of them, and they were to give them respect and di dignity. The reason given in the Bible for this was because the Israelites themselves were foreigners. They were slaves in Egypt. And where, wherever we stand on this issue, and this, of course, is something that uh, it's a debate that is going on, we should remember, however, that virtually all of us 
separated from a relationship. This is described as being strangers from the covenants and promises. God entered into a relationship first with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, and later with the nation at Mount Sinai through the covenants that he made with them. These were agreements in which God gave his word to fulfill certain promises, uh, as we said earlier, primarily the ones that were given to the descendants of Abraham and Isaac were that they would have be a nation, there would be a land, they would have a blessing. And some of the covenants that were given were, were made with, uh, with the descendants of Abraham were unconditional, such as the one in Genesis chapter 12. God promised the land, the descendants, the nation without condition. This was something that he would fulfill. Other, others of these covenants were conditional, such as the one that he made at Sinai with the law, where if the Israelites obeyed the law and worshipped God, they would be materially, materially blessed and they would prosper. However, these covenants represented the relationship which God had with Israel, but the Gentiles were not part of this. This was another way in which the Gentiles had no part in the blessings of God at that point. They needed to join Israel if they wanted to be able to participate in these blessings. And the fifth way that, that it's described here is that they were separated without hope. Now, to be without hope is perhaps the lowest place for a human being. Mankind can endure a great deal of hardship and disappointment if at least we have some hope, something to cling to. But when hope is gone, when in our mind the possibility that somehow things will get better, when that possibility fades away, a shroud, a shroud of darkness begins to descend over our spirit. The result is usually not good, and people seek to find some type then of immediate gratification. If you don't have hope for something better in the future, well then you're just going to live for the present. You're going to just live for immediate gratification. And really, that was what the Gentile world was like at that time. It was a time of licentiousness, of, of, of immorality. It was a time of, of a people without hope. They did not have hope, and so therefore they were seeking, their, in, seeking immediate gratification in the moment. And then all of this is summarized when it says in verse 12 that the Gentiles were without God in the world. Now the word, the Greek word that uh, is translated without God is atheos, from where we get our word atheist. Now when we use that word today, we think of someone who does not believe in God. However, the Gentile world, they believed in God. They had many gods. They were polytheists. They had all kinds of gods that they uh, were, were worshiping and sacrificing, a whole pantheon. However, since there is only one true God, there is only one creator God. There is only one real God in the world, in the universe. They could legitimately, legitimately be described as atheists, as being those without God. This is likewise how the world is today for those who lack faith in Jesus Christ. That they may believe in a higher power, they may have some spirituality or religious element to them, but nonetheless, they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, if they have never trusted the gospel that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again, they are in fact atheists, as it's used in this passage. They are without God. They were, are without the true God. And so this is what Paul is challenging these, uh, these Gentiles who are reading this passage to remember. This is what you were like in time past. But then he says, but now you have been brought near. With that doomful description of the Gentiles' condition, Paul now brings them good news. The structure of verses 11 through 22, which we read today, is actually quite similar to that of verses 1 through 10 that we studied last week. It begins with a picture of alienation and separation, but moves to one of exhilarating hope where in verses 1 through 10 it said you were dead in your trespasses and sin, but now you have been made alive in Christ, you have been redeemed, you have forgiveness of sin, redemption. And so that's talking about our, our relationship with God individually, spiritually, our salvation. This is now talking about the relationship that you 
Gentiles and the, uh, and the Jews, that, that separation that existed. It's the same, he's describing it and using the same types of arguments. You were separated and alienated, now you are made near, now you have been brought together. And so here it describes that you were once far off, now you are, you are brought near. This, as the Apostle describes, is another work that is accomplished through the cross. This would be the, in the sense that Christ's death was universal. He died for everyone. And as Paul makes very clear in Romans 3, Jews and Gentiles alike were all under the curse of sin. And through the cross, all of mankind could be made right with God. And thus, Jews and Gentiles share in this blessing of redemption. However, as this passage continues, Paul goes on to say things that were much more radical than just they, they could all come to faith in Christ. Keep in mind 
narcissism, and all the other expressions of the sinful nature that keep human beings isolated and separated from one another are abolished because of the cross and the creation of the church, which God calls the body of Christ today. It is God's answer. We hear an awful lot today about racism. We hear an awful lot about, about um, prejudice. We, we know that, that there, there are a lot of discussion, and in many cases our cities are blowing up because of these issues. The answer is right here. The answer is, is, is explained here. That boundary, that barrier that, was, that separated the Jews and Gentiles was broken down. If that barrier can be broken down, what is to keep us from, from coming together across our races, across the languages, across the ethnic boundaries? There is nothing. We are all together in Christ. We are all one. And this is the beauty and the magic of what it is that God has done for us through reconciling us and bringing us together in the body of Christ. The barrier that, that, that was established by God, actually, was that between Jews and Gentiles. That has been broken down, that has been separate, that, that has been abolished, it's evaporated, and now we as members of, the, of, of one body can come together regardless of who we are. If that barrier between Jew and Gentile can be broken down, certainly the barrier between black and white, between foreigner and national, between whatever it is, all of those can be broken down because we are one body in Christ, and this is the wonderful truth that we see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great truth of the body of Christ that has brought us together, broken down the barrier of, of partition that has separated us, and now brought us together. Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever.